Hi, my dear friends. So, in this session, we'll be taking a look at the surgery questions which were asked in the FMG exam on 18 June 2021. Let's try to recall as many surgery questions as possible. With the help of our mystians, we have been able to summarize good number of questions from this uh, 18th of June 2021. First of all, I would just like to take you to the different uh, question story, what have been asked uh, in the exams, just to give you a glimpse. And then we'll be discussing all these questions one by one. What I personally felt that on 18 June 2021, though we are able to summarize approximately 50 questions from surgery on 18th of June, but definitely there are overlapping questions with radiology, with uh, dermatology, with pathology, and with anatomy as well. So overall, if we take a look at the distribution of the FMG NB pattern, they say that 32 questions will be from surgery, and this time they definitely lived up to their expectation as we got more than 32 questions especially from the core surgery section, right? So, let's uh, take a look right from the beginning wherein we have also tried to incorporate the integrated questions in surgery. For example, now which of the following viruses is responsible for causing orchitis? So, if we take a look at these options, this was a very simple question. Orchitis, we have been taught right from the very beginning that it is the mumps virus which often causes orchitis. So, a simple single liner question, mumps virus, orchitis. Now, what is the diagnosis in the given image? So, herein, they gave you something similar picture wherein there was a malignancy seen in this particular area of the face and as you know, the line, right? So malignancies above this line, they are generally the basal cell carcinomas or the rodent ulcer. Again, this was a straight single liner question. Now, if you take a look, that uh, there was a question related to this uh, marjolin's ulcer. Now, a person who has suffered from burns this person might develop a marjolin ulcer in a long-standing burn ulcer or maybe a long-standing venous ulcer. Now, if we take a look, they did not mention about this marjolin ulcer as such, but they definitely mentioned that there was a burn one year back and then the patient developed ulcer. Now, what would be true for this? The options what they gave, they asked that all are true except the first option was slow growing. Yes, marjolin ulcer is a slow growing. The transformation into squamous cell carcinoma is slow growing. Lymphatic spread is uncommon. Yeah, but still it can occur though it is uncommon can transform into squamous cell carcinoma. Again, we have been reading this in classes that marjolin ulcer can transform into squamous cell carcinoma and they gave treatment is radiotherapy. My dear friends, this option that treatment is radiotherapy was not the correct answer. The treatment of choice for these is surgical excision. Though radiotherapy may be indicated if there is a lymphatic involvement. But once again, in a long-standing burn ulcer, marjolin ulcer, it is a slow growing. Lymphatic spread is not that common. It can transform into squamous cell carcinoma and the treatment of choice is surgery and not radiotherapy. So this is a glimpse from uh, the classes, the images which we discussed in the classes and here in these images and uh, since those who have attended the missed sessions, they know that this picture is still there in their application. Even in the missed next app, you have got the detailed info about this marjolin ulcer. Now, another question. A 30-year-old 
female. As we have been discussing in the surgery sessions, whether in the face-to-face -face classes or the online live classes or in the Miss Next app, we have divided surgery into different sections wherein the systemic surgery part has been divided into pediatric surgery, adult surgery and onco surgery just because that if we have to solve these type of questions then immediately we go to the adult surgical story. This is a female, sudden onset of central abdominal pain radiating to the back. Now central abdominal pain radiating to the back. Definitely the options which were given here the acute appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis and ruptured ectopic. You know that appendicitis pain would be in the right iliac fossa. Ectopic pregnancy may be in the right or the left iliac fossa or maybe in the lower abdomen. But he is saying central abdominal pain radiating to the back. So now you have to rule out between acute cholecystitis and acute pancreatitis if the pain would have been in the right hypochondrium radiating to the back. 30 year old female, then the answer would have been acute cholecystitis. But herein the question is central abdominal pain radiating to the back. So if it is more in the center, the preferred answer would be acute pancreatitis. The preferred answer here would be acute pancreatitis, right? Okay. Now in the classes, what we have seen these are the class notes which you would have written in acute pancreatitis. As you can see here, there is a sudden severe abdominal pain radiating to the back, relieved on sitting or leaning forwards, right? So this is something what you have written in the notes and therein we have also seen these uh, colon sign and the gray turner sign, the colens is bluish discoloration around the umbilicus and uh, the gray turner is bluish discoloration in the flanks. This is also something which was asked in this 18 June 2021 exam. They gave you an image, not like this image, but there was a obese uh, type of abdomen wherein there was just a bluish halo around the umbilicus and that was, they asked, in which condition do we see this? The options this time were clear cut and uh, relatively simple where they asked about acute pancreatitis. We know that acute pancreatitis can be either just an interstitial pancreatitis, edematous pancreatitis or necrotizing pancreatitis, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. We know that these gray turner and colons, they are most often seen in acute hemorrhagic pancreatitis. They did not confuse us this time and they simply asked acute pancreatitis. So with this particular slide on 18th of June, we had two questions. Fine. This is just a depiction of how the different pathologies can present in the right hypochondrium so that you have a clear cut idea. This is a picture taken from the classes what we conducted, whether it was face to face, the online live or the lectures in the Miss Next app. Now this is gallbladder stone picture. The pain would be in the right hypochondrium radiating to the back. The ultrasound is the diagnostic modality and symptomatic gallstone patients we are doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This stone can slip into the common bile duct can cause cholangitis. For these type of stones, in emergency we are doing ERCP and stenting, while in routine CBD stones we are doing ERCP and passing a dormia basket in the CBD and doing stone extraction from the CBD. Now sometimes if the stone slips and comes to block the pancreatic duct, this is going to cause a complete traffic jam situation in the pancreatic duct wherein the proximal pancreatic duct will be dilated and this would be causing acute pancreatitis. This acute pancreatitis, as you can see here, the gallbladder is located more towards the right hypochondrium while the pancreas is more central in location. That is why if they ask you about the central abdominal pain, then focus on pancreatitis. Fine. 
Now, how do we treat this? Generally, uh, we do the pancreatic enzymes for radiological confirmation. We do a CT scan and the treatment is more or less conservative. Another pathology what can present in the right hypochondrium are the abscesses inside the liver. There can be pyogenic liver abscess, amoebic liver abscess or hydrated cyst. This image, this is a water lily sign what we are seeing in hydrated cyst inside the liver and they are treated, managed accordingly. And sometimes there may be a sigmoid volvulus as well wherein we find a coffee bean sign, bird of prey sign in the right hypochondrium. Right. Now, another question, identify the operation in the image shown. So, if you have to identify the operation in the image, let us take a look at the image here. Now, in this particular image, my dear friends, what you are seeing in this image is, there is a cut here, just distal, in the distal part of the stomach. So, what structures are being removed here? The distal stomach, the duodenum, the head and neck of the pancreas, the common bile duct, the cystic duct and the gallbladder. And what you are left with here is the stomach, the pancreatic duct, the hepatic duct and the jejunum. And now what you are going to do is, you are going to take this jejunum and do a pancreatic jejunostomy, hepatic jejunostomy and a gastro jejunostomy which we call as triple bypass operation, which we call as triple bypass operation and that is what is a Whipple's operation. Now this picture what you are seeing, this again is taken from your notes where we are doing this Whipple's operation, pancreatic duodenectomy, a triple bypass, pancreatic jejunostomy, hepatic jejunostomy and a gastro jejunostomy. And uh, this was the image what we saw during our lectures. The red shaded area has been removed. This is what we saw in the classes. We have removed the distal stomach, the duodenum, the head and neck of the pancreas, the common pile duct, the cystic duct and the gallbladder and now what we are left with is the jejunum. So we have joined the jejunum with the pancreatic duct, pancreatic jejunostomy, the hepatic jejunostomy, the gastro jejunostomy which is the triple bypass operation. So again this was from the pancreatic stories, right. Another question identify the operation in the image below. Now, something similar to this, the image was there in the exam and herein what you can see is that jejunum has been taken and this jejunum has been connected with the pancreatic duct. Now, this is a side to side pancreatico jejunostomy and this is something what we do in the treatment of chronic pancreatitis. So, this is what we saw in the chronic pancreatitis story wherein there was chain of lakes appearance. Again, this is a picture from your notes, the chain of lakes appearance where you see multiple dilatations in the pancreatic duct and what we are doing is we are connecting the jejunum. The side of the jejunum is anastomosed with the side of the pancreatic duct and that is what is a modified pustos operation longitudinal side-to-side -side pancreatic jejunostomy or the phrase operation. Right, let's take a look at another question here. A patient presented with dysphagia and the barium swallow image demonstrates. Now, my dear friends, I would like to draw your attention here. This image what you are seeing, this has been asked number of times, number of times and they want you to recognize the classical bird beak appearance. If you focus on this particular area, my dear friends, this is a classical bird beak appearance and this is characteristic of ecclesia cardia. And I would like to tell you that this question was asked in 2020 and the same question has been asked in 2021 exam as well. So this is a hot question. Herein, this is what we read in the classes. This is the image what you are still having in your application. This is a classical bird beak or pencil tip appearance what you can see. 
to differentiate this from cancer esophagus, in cancer esophagus, you find a filling defect here. Filling defect is there. Plus, you may find a rat tail appearance. Now, this rat tailing can also be seen in ecclesia cardia. Like this thing, what we are seeing as a string, this is a rat tail appearance. But rat tail is more classical for cancer esophagus. Okay, so I hope that all of you would have marked this answer right. Another very commonly asked image based question and I am very confident that none of you would have marked this answer wrong. Again, this is a repeat question. The same image was asked in December 2019 exam. You can nicely appreciate the corkscrew esophagus, the corkscrew esophagus. And this is classically seen in diffuse esophageal spasm. But they did not ask diffuse esophageal spasm. They simply asked, what is this? So it is a corkscrew esophagus. My dear doctors, this is the differential image when we were doing our discussions. At that point of time, we saw how different differential diagnosis related to dysphagia can be asked in the exam. Like in this particular picture, you are seeing a Zenkus diverticulum. This can also cause dysphagia. In this picture, this is ecclesia cardia, where there is narrowing of the lower esophagus leading to proximal dilatation. This is a corkscrew esophagus, what we have seen, seen in diffuse esophageal spasm, which can lead to a dysphagia. This is a lie structure image. This lie structure related to ingestion of castics, this can also cause dysphagia. And this is the image of cancer esophagus where there is a filling defect here and a rat tailing here. Another cause of dysphagia can be dysphagia leucoria, wherein there is compression by the aberrant right subclavian artery or rarely there can be a Schatzky's ring at the squamocolumnar junction. So all these images, they are causing dysphagia and just from this one slide, they asked two questions from us. They asked about ecclesia cardia. They asked about cork screw esophagus. So I hope you would have marked this right. Another commonly asked question. Now barium enema image demonstrates. This image, again, when we were reading about the diverticulosis of colon, we have seen this image, the classical saw tooth appearance the classical sawtooth appearance. This is depicting the sigmoid colon diverticula. Now these sigmoid colon diverticulas, they are false diverticulas. They are acquired diverticulas. They are seen in elderly people, especially those individuals who remain constipated. So there is a traffic jam situation in the rectum because of which the proximal colon, that is the sigmoid colon gets dilated, high pressure in the dilated proximal sigmoid colon, weak sigmoid colon in elderly people, this high pressure will force the mucosa submucosa of the sigmoid colon to protrude outwards. And this is the story generally for all the acquired diverticulas, right? And classical sort of appearance seen in diverticulosis of colon. And I'm pretty sure that again this question is something which you would have not marked wrong at all. If we take a look, this is what was discussed in the classes. Now diverticulosis of colon, most commonly in the sigmoid colon, constipated elderly, falls acquired. And on barium enema, you can see we have even highlighted this on barium enema, you see a saw tooth appearance. And uh, these images also belong to this diverticulosis of colon, right? So I hope again, you would not have committed a mistake. Now, this is an overlapping pediatrics question, wherein it was easy to identify. This is a case of when the stomach intestines have gone up into the thorax. This is due to congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So you can see the intestines coming up into the thorax in a small baby. 
obviously this is not a pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade or tracheoesophageal fistula as you are easily able to identify the loops of bowel in the thorax. So, this was a clear cut case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Now, this question, a 60 year old lady presented with a hard breast mass of 6 by 4 centimeter in size as shown in the image. There was a single lymph node underneath this mass. Now, in this particular question, there are two views coming from the recalls side that there was a single lymph node which was fixed and there was another lymph node which was mobile, whatever it is. There was no evidence of metastasis. That means, now if you take a look at this particular picture, this may not be the exact picture asked in the exam, but the moral of the story here is there is a large mass inside the breast and he has also mentioned 6 by 4 centimeters, 6 by 4 and you know more than 5 centimeter becomes T3 stage plus there were lymph node involvement as well. Now what are the different options in the treatment of breast cancer? If it is a small cancer localized in one uh, quadrant of the breast, we can do breast conservative surgery. If the lymph nodes are involved, we can do a lymph node dissection as well along with breast conservative surgery. Whether to give chemo or not depends on the lymph node status, depends on the tumor grade. Whether to give hormonal therapy or not depends on the presence of estrogen and progesterone receptors. If they are positive, then yes, you are going to give hormonal therapy wherein tamoxifen is given in premenopausal females and anastrozoles in postmenopausal females. And my dear doctors, if HER2 new gene is positive, then you are giving trastuzumab, trastuzumab, right? <clears throat> if suppose it is a locally advanced disease, like in this particular case, it was a locally advanced breast cancer. In this, the tumor may be big in size, there may be extensive lymph node involvement, but there is no metastasis. That is what is a locally advanced breast cancer. In this particular case, the ideal treatment is you give chemotherapy before surgery, which we call as neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is to downgrade the tumor, downstage the tumor. If you are able to reduce the tumor bulk, and then you are doing a modified radical mastectomy, the chances of getting clear margins around the tumor becomes high. That means the chances of leaving residual tumor would be less. So you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this case, do a modified radical mastectomy, and then give the remaining chemotherapy in this patient. Whether to treat it by radiation or not, again depends on whether the lymph nodes are heavily positive or not whether there is any positive resection margin coming out or not. Regarding hormonal therapy, the same story, ERPR, and trastuzumab or Herceptin, the same story depends on her to new gene. In this particular question, he has clearly mentioned that there was no evidence of metastasis. That means it is not a metastatic disease. If he would have said that there is a evidence of metastasis maybe in the lumbar vertebra or thoracic vertebra or somewhere. Then for metastatic breast cancer, we mainly focus on palliative simple mastectomy, right? So the options which were given for this question, radical mastectomy with chemotherapy, modified radical mastectomy followed by adjuvant chemotherapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy with modified radical mastectomy, with adjuvant chemotherapy and palliative mastectomy. So this is ruled out. We are not doing radical mastectomy at all. Palliative we are not doing because it is not a metastatic disease. That means we have to focus on these two options. MRM followed by adjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant with MRM followed by completion chemotherapy. So because the size of the tumor is big, the tumor breast ratio is high looking at the image. So the preferred treatment should be neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the MRM followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. 
And my dear doctors, we have seen this in our classes as well. When we were discussing about the modified radical mastectomy in our classes, we have seen the different type of mastectomies, uh, simple mastectomy, modified radical mastectomy, radical mastectomy, breast conservative surgery nicely. For example, this is a modified radical mastectomy specimen wherein there was a large tumor inside the breast. We have given new adjuvant chemotherapy for this case and then we have done the MRM. This what you are seeing is the nipple surrounded by the areola and we have also proceeded with the axillary dissection in this particular female. After doing a mastectomy, depends on the wish of the female. If the female wants to have a breast reconstruction, we can go for this breast reconstruction. Most commonly done with silicon gel. Another question, postpartum, lactating female, presents with redness swelling of the breast, identify the pathology in the given image. Now we all know postpartum, lactating, at the time of lactation, if there is any evidence of acute inflammation, like you can see redness swelling, ruber tumor calla dollar functulasia, ruber redness tumor swelling calor, raised temperature dollar pain, and functulasia is loss of function. So this should be something related to mastitis. Now let's take a look at the options here. Fibroadenoma, phyloidist tumor, no. Mondas is thrombophlebitis of the superficial veins of the skin of the breast and the chest wall. Now if you take a look at the image, my dear doctors, this becomes a quite clear cut image here. Almost like this image was there in the exam, you can see there is a localized collection of maybe pus inside. And so most likely the diagnosis is clear cut. It is a case of breast abscess. I hope all of you would have marked this answer correct. This is something what we have seen in our classes, the image of mastitis, commonly seen during lactation and pregnancy. Why? Because if during pregnancy lactation, the secretion of Montgomery tubercles are less and the nipple remains dry, the female does not use external lubricating agents also, then cracks develop in the nipple and when the baby takes the feed, then Staph aureus from the baby's mouth that travel through the cracks in the nipple and gets inside the mother's breast and then there is a bacterial party by the staph inside the mother's breast leading to mastitis if untreated as females are quite shy. The staph party will continue and this will lead to breast abscess. Another question related to this following image is suggestive of which stage of breast cancer. Now let's take a look at this image. Herein we can nicely see that uh, there are multiple pits seen and this is a classical orange peel appearance that is puny orange appearance and my dear doctors as we know that this uh, puny orange appearance we have written in our notes during the classes that skin involvement is pudy orange, right? Okay. If you take a look at the staging, my dear doctors, skin involvement is pudy orange. And here you can see T4 stage, any size, T4A, chest wall, T4B, skin, T4C, both chest wall and skin, and T4D is inflammatory. Now this is again a picture taken from your notes, right? So T4B is skin and this is what the examiner wants to know here in this case. This is a PUD orange and uh, in our clinical case discussions what we had, we had the same question and out of these T4A is chest wall and here it is skin involvement. So T4B is skin involvement, right? So I hope you would not have committed a mistake in this question as well. Fine. Let's move further. Now, alcoholic male presented with pain in the epigastrium radiating to the back. What is the likely diagnosis in the given CT image? Okay, so he's talking about alcoholic male and he's talking about epigastric pain, 
radiating to the back. Okay. Let us take a look at the options before we look at the image here. Can it be amoebic liver abscess? Amoebic liver abscess, yes, alcoholics, it is common, but the pain is more in the right hypochondria. It may be radiating here to the inferior angle of scapula. Pancreatic pseudocyst, this pseudocyst should be located somewhere in the central abdomen and we know that pain of acute pancreatitis can radiate to the back. Acute cholecystitis, again the pain should have been in the right hypochondrium radiating to the back and hydrated cyst, this is, if there is hydrated cyst inside the liver, the liver is getting enlarged and this may cause discomfort in the right hypochondrium. Let us try to find it out, what is the key word in this particular question? He is saying pain in the epigastrium and out of the various choices what he has given to you, the other three like the amoebic liver abscess or acute cholecystitis or hydrated cyst, the pain would be more in the right hypochondrium. But in pseudocyst of the pancreas, the pain should be in the epigastrium. Let us confirm this by seeing the image as well. Now in this particular image, herein you are seeing something, something. So probably this may be some cystic collection. Now, whether this is liver or not, if we take a look, now this what we are seeing is the liver, this what we are seeing right here. Now, if you focus on this particular location, this is the location of the pancreas and he is showing something in relation to the pancreas and not in relation to the liver. So, our diagnosis becomes more certain and we should have marked this as pancreatic pseudocyst. During our discussion in the classes, this is what we saw that a pseudocyst is something which is composed of enzymes and fluid around the pancreas. It is not lined by epithelium, that is why we call it a pseudo. There cannot be any malignancy as there is no epithelium in this pseudocyst. Usually they resolve spontaneously, the patients are generally asymptomatic, but they may even persist and if they enlarge, they can extend from mediastinum above to the pelvis below. They can present with pressure symptoms like epigastric pain, fullness, malabsorption, infection can occur and this epigastric pain would be radiating to the back. Sometimes even rupture can occur. We can do a CT scan. And if there is any doubt in the diagnosis, like this was the picture what we have seen in our classes, this is the pancreas here and this is a big pseudocyst around the pancreas. This is rich in amylase and not in CEA. If this would have been a tumor, it would have been rich in carcinoembryonic antigen. If the cyst is more than 6 centimeter in size, more than 12 weeks old, symptomatic complication, then yes, we are doing a cystojejunostomy. Like what you are seeing here, this is a cyst and we are connecting the jejunum with the cyst. That is internal drainage is what we are doing for the pseudocyst of pancreas. Fine. Another question, if we take a look, pale orphan anide nuclei is seen in. This is something which is so commonly asked. Last year, they asked about Samoma bodies. This time, they have asked about orphan anide nuclei. Samoma bodies, we know, they are seen. Samoma bodies, this is the histo histology image of Samoma bodies. These Samoma bodies, they are seen in papillary thyroid cancer, papillary renal cell carcinoma, serous adenoma of ovary, salivary adenomas, meningiomas. This meningioma samoma body was asked last year in 2020 and this time they asked about this orphan empty eyed nuclei, any eyed nuclei what you are seeing here. This is a classical feature of the papillary thyroid cancer. Not only the image is what we saw, we have also written this in our notes if you carefully go through them the differential table between papillary and follicular, you have written that in papillary thyroid cancer, you find orphan anide nuclei 
and semoma bodies, right? Most common cause of papillary is irradiation to the neck, especially below 5 years of age, while most common cause of follicular is long-standing endemic goitus, right? So I hope, I am pretty confident that you would not have marked this wrong. Now another image based question here, identify the pathology in the given image. Now I would really say that we all are fortunate that we had this image seen number of times, not only during the classes, but also this image is there in your mobile application, in the study material, right? So this is a classical image taken from Bailey and Love. And this is the familial adenomatous polyposis. I hope Miss Tienz would not have marked this wrong because this was emphasized a lot during our discussions. The options were hematomatous polyposis, adenomatous polyposis, colon cancer or juvenile polyp, hematomatous polyposis, this is multiple juvenile polyps in the intestine with melanin pigmentation of the lips, oral mucosa, hands and forearms. Now again, this is a picture taken from your notes wherein we discussed about this Pugh's Jagger syndrome this is familial hematomatous polyposis. We discussed the same image like this, that is familial adenomatous polyposis and you can see the red L mark here. This is Love and Bailey. As we know that in surgery, many images do come from the standard textbook of surgery, Love and Bailey. So we had this image right from there. More than 100 adenomas diagnostic of FAP, Pre-malignant can lead to colon cancer associated with Gardner's and Turcot syndrome. Gardner's is FAP plus epidermoid cyst, desmoid tumors, and uh, Turcot's is FAP associated with brain tumors. Also, my dear doctors, I would like to emphasize that there were so many single-liner questions from different, different subjects, and all those single-liners have been summarized in the missed all-in-one book, and we are proud to say that God is great, God was kind to us this time, that he gave 132 questions from that small missed all-in-one book. But my recommendation to you is first go through the missed classes, either the face-to-face -face classes or the online live or the missed next app, and then go through that single liner missed all-in-one book because that would give you the best output. So we have written about this familial adenomatous polyposis in our notes also, the Gardner's turcots and so on. This is pre-malignant. So I don't think you would have had any problem in marking this question right. All the mistakes, you would not have marked this wrong, I guess. This is familial adenomatous polyposis, right? So this is familial adenomatous polyposis, great. Nine-year-old boy was having dinner with his parents in the hotel room. Suddenly, after gulping the food bolus, he started feeling the choking sensation. Next step to be done. Now, if we take a look at this particular question here, hyperextension of the neck and look for the airway, large sips of water or fizzy drinks to push the food bolus down, five upper abdominal thrust to force the vomiting, and the endotracheal intubation. Basically what has happened, sometimes if the food bolus is getting stuck at the cricopharynx, as we know that is the narrowest part of the esophagus, generally the commonest foreign body what we see in small babies is a coin. But in adults, it is the impacted food bolus which gets stuck. Now, if we are talking about these foreign bodies in the esophagus, and if we are not talking about the food bolus, we are just talking about, say, a coin getting stuck. Many a times, this coin may not get stuck. It may negotiate the cricopharynx and it may pass spontaneously down and out from the body. If the patient is asymptomatic, no active intervention is needed. But sometimes, as in this particular situation, if this has stuck at the cricopharynx, what should be the best thing? If we are not talking about the food bolus, but we are talking about, say, a coin 
or maybe any other foreign body like a denture or something like that. Then at home, what we can try is we can try giving the upper abdominal thrust or the lower chest thrust so that the foreign body comes out. But the ideal recommendation is immediately go to the hospital, take this patient to the hospital, do a endoscopic removal. In case of batteries, even if they are not impacted, we try to take them out because there is a risk of corrosion. If we are talking about a food bolus impaction, then the first thing what we can do is we can give large sips of water or fizzy drinks that may help this food bolus go down. If this does not help, then we can try the upper abdominal thrust or the lower sternal thrust and try to move that out through vomiting. And if that also does not work, then we have to go for endoscopic removal. So a stepwise approach, the protocol for this large food bolus. Food bolus, my dear doctors, food bolus impacted, causing choking sensation or maybe cyanosis. In this case, we are giving the large sips of water or fizzy drinks so that the food bolus goes down. If that does not help, then we should go for this uh, upper abdominal thrust. And if that does not work, we should go for endoscopic removal. So that is a stepwise approach for this particular foreign body. Right. Now, this is a question wherein he is asking, following is true except, all are true except. Now, what is this? This is actually a question which is, an overlapping question, it belongs mainly to the orthopedics. Two images were given to you. One image, there was a swelling type of thing on the wrist. And in the second image, they were showing an operation where there was a slit seen. And here, you can see a translucent type of thing. So this is something which is ganglion, which is related to the tendon sheath, right? Now in orthopedics, in ganglion, we know that uh, this is something which is related to an accumulation of gelatinous fluid in relation to the tendon nerve sheath. These are transilluminant swellings. The chances of recurrence are very high in the ganglion. We can try treating it by injecting hyaluronidase or we can go for surgical excision. Most often they are seen on the dorsal and the volar surface of wrist as shown in the picture also. And the treatment is surgical excision. Yes, the treatment can be injection of hyaluronidase or surgical excision, but the chances of recurrence are high. Here you have to find out which is wrong. He is saying less chance of recurrence. No, there are more chances of recurrence in the ganglion. So that is how we can rule this out. Another question, 10 months old baby presented with empty scrotum. On examination, the right testis was found in the right inguinal canal while the left testis was found in the perineum. Correct about the diagnosis. My dear doctors, this is a repeat question from 2020 again. The same similar question was there in 2020 FMG exam as well. And during our classes, once again, whether it was face-to-face, -face, online live, or the missed next app, we have read that what is an undescended testis and what is an ectopic testis. Undescended, when the testis is arrested anywhere in the normal path of descent. And the normal path of descent, right from the transabdominal, the deep inguinal ring, the inguinal canal, the superficial ring, top of the scrotum and then down to the bottom of the scrotum. This is the normal path. So if the testis is arrested in this path, wherein most common site is the inguinal canal, that is called as undescended. But if the testis deviate from the normal path and lie elsewhere, then we call it as ectopic, most commonly in the superficial inguinal pouch, but they are found in the perineum, maybe in the femoral canal or at the root of penis. So my dear doctors, this is something which you have written in your notes nicely. Now herein, just to remember it, agar testis apne normal raste mein atak jati hai, 
तो अनडिसेंडेड अगर उस नॉर्मल रास्ते से भटक जाती है तो एक्टोपिक अटक अनडिसेंडेड भटक एक्टोपिक राइट सो दिस इज हाउ वी कैन रिमेंबर दिस नाइसली एंड इन दिस वी हैव सीन द इमेजेस एज वेल दैट दिस इज हाउ द एम्प्टी स्ट्रोटम मींस नाउ लेट्स टेक अ लुक एट द क्वेश्चन हियर ही इज सेइंग वंस अगेन लेट्स टेक अ लुक एट दिस क्वेश्चन the right test is in the right inguinal canal so if it is in the inguinal canal then it will be undescended and the left test is in the perineum that means the left test is would be ectopic so it's a case of right undescended and left ectopic test is is that in the option if you look at the option bilateral undescended no bilateral ectopic no right undescended and left ectopic yes so this is the right answer right ectopic and left undescended no right so i hope since this was a repeat question you would not have had any problem in marking the correct answer and this question was asked in your test as well conducted by mist another question 18 year old boy presented in agony with sudden onset of severe pain in the groin region associated with redness and swelling of the scrotum on examination the right testis has gone up possible diagnosis in this boy again i'll take you to your notes my dear doctors if you take a look what you have written in testicular torsion we have seen these images in testicular torsion during our classes and if you take a look here sudden severe agonizing pain in the groin and the lower abdomen testis high in the scrotum right associated with redness and swelling of the scrotum but there is no fever in torsion which is a differentiating feature from epididymo or cricus okay we can even do a prens test which is asked in the exams this prens test is positive in epididymo or cricus that is elevation of scrotum relief pain in epididymo or cricus but the pain worsens in cases of torsion so these were the important points which have been highlighted and we have also highlighted this test is high in the scrotum during our classes so i hope my dear doctors you would not have faced difficulty in marking the correct answer for this question as well there was sudden onset the boy was in agony sudden onset severe pain in the groin a redness swelling of the scrotum the right test is gone up so this should be a case of a right sided testicular torsion right fine Thirty-four year old female presented with a mass in the inguinal region, which produced gurgling sound on reduction. The mass reduced completely on pressing it through the deep inguinal ring. Possible diagnosis in this lady, my dear doctors. Again, if we go to the hernia story, this is what you have written in your notes. You have made this diagram in your notes. when we are differentiating the indirect from direct inguinal hernias we know that indirect inguinal hernia comes out through the deep inguinal ring it moves in downward forward and medial direction and there are high chances of coming it down to the bottom of the scrotum while a direct inguinal hernia which is medial to the inferior epigastric vessels coming out through the hesalbeck triangle in a forward direction less chances of going into the scrotum whenever the neck of the hernial sac would be narrow the chances of strangulation or pain would be high if we compare the neck of indirect from direct then indirect deep inguinal ring would be narrower so the chances of strangulation or pain would be higher in indirect inguinal hernias as compared to direct inguinal hernias that means if you have to choose between indirect and direct for this particular question he is saying that it is reduced completely on pressing it through the deep inguinal ring so he has given a key word to you here the deep inguinal ring so the diagnosis should go in favor of indirect inguinal hernia also another key word what i would like you to make a point on is the gurgling sound now whenever there is any swelling which has got liquid and air inside if you try to reduce that swelling 
it will produce the gurgling sound. For example, we talk about a boy sign in Zenker's diverticulum. In Zenker's diverticulum, if there is a diverticula here in the pharynx, this is what is a gurgling sound, my dear doctors. This is because of mixing of air with water. So whether it is the pharyngeal pouch or it is a hernia where the intestines have gone, if you try to reduce that, intestines would be having air and liquid. So that is going to produce the gurgling sound. Okay. The confusing thing because of which many students got confused in this question was the 34 year old female. As soon as the students saw female, they started thinking of femoral hernia. That means in this particular question, there was a doubt between indirect inguinal hernia and femoral hernia. And since they saw it as a female, they marked it as femoral hernia. But my dear doctors, there was an important keyword here in the question that the hernia reduced completely on pressing it through the deep inguinal ring. That means if you go back to the notes here, femoral hernia, yes, it is four times more common in females as compared to males. However, it is more commonly seen in low weight elderly females, low weight elderly females, old age, okay. But anyways, 34 year old female, why we are ruling out this femoral hernia? For a simple logic that the hernia is reducing completely when we are pressing it through the deep inguinal ring. My dear doctors, there is a three finger test called a Siemens test here. And in this three finger test, what we do is, if we have got any doubt whether it is indirect, direct or femoral, we reduce the hernia inside, we take three fingers, block these three openings, the deep ring, the Heselbeck's triangle and the femoral canal. And then ask the patient to stand, ask the patient to cuff and then release our finger one by one. If you release the finger on the deep inguinal ring, ask the patient to cuff and the hernia comes out through the deep inguinal ring, a swelling comes out through this, then it's a case of indirect inguinal hernia. But if the swelling does not come out like this, you again block the deep inguinal ring. Now you remove the finger from the Heselbeck's triangle, ask the patient to cuff. If the swelling bulges out, then it should be a case of direct inguinal hernia. But if the swelling does not come out, you again block the Heselbeck's opening, remove the finger from the femoral canal opening, ask the patient to cuff. If the swelling comes out, then it's a case of femoral hernia. So that is how whenever there is any doubt in the diagnosis, we take the help of the Siemens technique, three finger test, blocking these three potential sites. And that is how we can differentiate indirect inguinal hernia, direct inguinal hernia and the femoral hernia. And in this question, there was a clear cut hint that the swelling is reduced completely on pressing through the deep inguinal ring. Let's take a look at uh, another question. Elderly male on digital rectal examination was found to have a rectal mass, raising the suspicion of rectal cancer. His bowel habits are otherwise normal and he visited the hospital for a routine checkup. Which of the following should be recommended as the next step in this patient? That means the key words here to be highlighted, he is talking about an elderly male, there was a rectal mass and it was just a routine checkup. He has not come for any complaints, but elderly male, rectal mass needs to be investigated. And in the investigations, if we have got a clear cut finding, then for colorectal areas, we need to do a colonoscopy and if we find a mass out there, we can do a biopsy, right? That is the first step. And what he is asking, he is also asking what should be your next step in this patient. So my dear doctors, CT scan. Now CT scan would be required when we have made the diagnosis of a malignancy and we want to see how far the malignancy has gone. However, for rectal cancers, MRI gives us better information as compared to CT. 
flexible sigmoidoscopy and biopsy. Yes, if it is a rectal mass, we can go for sigmoidoscopy and biopsy, but generally we are doing that rigid sigmoidoscopy, not the flexible one for these masses if we have to take the biopsy. And uh, a better option than sigmoidoscopy is a full coloroscopy and biopsy. And the reason is this full colonoscopy will not only show you about the rectal mass story, will not only help you in taking a biopsy from the rectal mass, but this full colonoscopy will also help you in identifying if there is any synchronous metachronous lesion in any other part of the colon. So if you have to choose between flexible sigmoidoscopy versus full colonoscopy, I would recommend to go for full colonoscopy and biopsy. Barium enema, like in colon cancer, we see apple core appearance. If you go to your notes, now this is a differentiating table regarding what should be your clinical approach in various malignancies. This is for oral cancer, this is for esophageal cancer, this is for stomach cancer, and this is for uh, colorectal cancer. As you have written in your notes, in your clinical approach for oral cancer, first you are doing a bimanual examination and then going for a biopsy. In esophageal cancer, patient has come to you with dysphagia, you are doing a barium swallow, and if you find any issue there, a filling defect there, then you are going for endoscopy biopsy. For stomach cancer, if the patient has come to you with malina, you are going for stool for occult blood. If the patient has come to you with epigastric mass, the first investigation would be ultrasound of the abdomen. And then if there is any suspicion, then you are going for upper the endoscopy and biopsy. While for colorectal malignancies, patient presenting with bleeding per rectum or a mass incidentally detected in elderly male, you are going for colonoscopy and biopsy as the first investigation. Right? Okay. So that is how you should have marked this answer. Now another question, again something similar image was there as we have been telling you that in the image based questions the ideal way of approaching them is to first have a look at the image and then go for the answer. Now here it was something similar like this where you are able to see a narrow string type of thing, right? And in the question, when we saw the language of the question, he had given us something which was favoring for tuberculosis. One here, history, low-grade fever, anorexia, weight loss. So there was history of tuberculosis in the question. In the contrast evaluation, he said the following image is seen. And in this, again, I would like all of you to see on this particular area. Now, in this particular area, you can see a narrow string. So this is a terminal ileal tuberculosis, okay? Now, simple string sign is seen in TB, while string sign of Cantor is seen in Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, which is a transmural disease, skip lesions, in that case also, the lumen gets narrowed and when you are doing a contrast study, you find a thin string of contrast going through that area. That is what we call a string sign of Cantor, right? So I hope if uh, you take a look at this question, there was no confusion whether it was Crohn's or not as the options were quite clear cut. Ileocecal tuberculosis, volvulus, no in volvulus, you find a coffee bean sign, bent inner tube sign. In cancer colon, you see apple core appearance and diverticulosis, you see sawtooth appearance. So I hope this is the image which I have taken from your classes, wherein we have seen this particular image in the classes. And this image is already there in the study material of the application. So I hope you would have not marked this wrong. Now this particular image is an image taken directly from Bailey and Love, wherein they have shown the stages, the Borman staging of gastric cancer. This is a Borman staging of gastric cancer, a direct image taken from Bailey and Love, okay? And they just ask, following staging is done for which of the following malignancies, okay? This is a gastric cancer staging. Just to specify here, 
uh, the different stagings what we are using for oral cancer, the AJCC TNM staging, for bladder cancer, the WHO TNM staging, for gastric cancer, the Borman staging, for colon cancer, we are doing a Duke staging. This classical picture belongs to the gastric cancer Borman staging. Another question here, a female presenting with epigastric and right hypochondrial pain radiating to the back with guarding radiating in the right hypochondrium. She had similar episodes of pain in the right hypochondrium off and on for last one year. Once again, let's take a look at the keywords, my dear doctors. This is a female. The pain is in the epigastrium and the right hypochondrium. Now, my dear doctors, be careful. He has specified right hypochondrium. He has also said that this is associated with pain radiating to the back with guarding and rigidity. Okay? So, this guarding rigidity in the upper abdomen. Now, this is seen in acute cholecystitis, wherein because of a large stone blocking the mouth of the gallbladder, the gallbladder is distended, acute inflammation, redness, swelling of the gallbladder, and this causes sudden onset of severe pain in the right hypochondrium radiating to the inferior angle of right scapula, right, and sometimes to the tip of the right shoulder. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, localized guarding and rigidity, these are the features of acute cholecystitis. When you do a clinical examination, if you try to insinuate your four fingers beneath the right costal margin and ask the patient to take a deep breath, patient suddenly catches her breath. This is what is Murphy's sign. Okay? So this picture is quite similar to acute cholecystitis. Okay? And he has clearly mentioned the right hypochondrial story. Also, he has given you a history that she had similar episodes in the past of pain in the right hypochondrium. So, if you have to choose the correct answer, yes, the best answer would be acute cholecystitis. Acute pancreatitis, the pain would have been more central in location, radiating to the back. Also, in acute pancreatitis, the clinical signs of guarding and rigidity are not that obvious because pancreas is lying in the retroperitoneum. Hydrated cyst should be confined inside the liver unless and until there is any peritonitis, there should not be any guarding or rigidity. Amoebic liver abscesses, yes. Pain in the right hypochondrium, right, radiating to the back. Similar episodes, similar episodes in the past for one year should not be amoebic liver abscess. Another thing which is going more in favor of acute cholecystitis, the long history, the one-year history, and she is a female. Amoebic liver abscesses, you would find more commonly in alcoholic males. So out of the given options, the diagnosis should be acute cholecystitis. Another question, after binge drinking of alcohol, yeah, young male presented with vomiting and upper GI bleed, most likely cause. Now, my dear doctors, this particular question is again a question which has been asked recently. December 2019, we had a similar question, but in that question, they did not mention upper GI bleed, they mentioned pneumomediastinum. Okay? There are two pathologies where the examiner is using the terms binge drinking of alcohol. One is Borhavi syndrome, another is Mallory tear. He is telling a young male after alcohol, vomiting and upper GI bleed. Now, how to differentiate whether it's Borhavi or Mallory Weiss? Borhavi syndrome, spontaneous esophageal rupture, that is a rupture of the esophagus, the lower esophagus posterior lateral wall on the left side, so that the gastric contents are released into the mediastinum under pressure and there is huge amount of air in the mediastinum. Left-sided chest pain radiating to the left shoulder and to the left arm mimicking myocardial infarction, Meckler's stride, vomiting chest pain, subcutaneous emphysema, pathognomic subcutaneous emphysema and on auscultation you find that Hammond's sign, Hammond's crunch, mediastinal crunch, footsteps in the snow. That is Borhavi, if there is rupture of the esophagus. But in Mallory Weiss, what will happen? 
it is not a rupture it is just a longitudinal mucosal tear like this is what you have written in your notes a longitudinal gastric mucosal tear in the cardia of stomach close to gastroesophageal junction this is a common cause of hematemesis okay mallory's tear in alcoholics this is a longitudinal gastric mucosal tear there is no pneumomediastinum here there is just bleeding hematemesis so in the question he has clearly mentioned upper gi bleed so the diagnosis becomes very clear cut it is mallory v steer and not borhavi syndrome duodenal ulcer perforation should have presented with perforation peritonitis and tension pneumothorax would have been something related to dyspnea severe respiratory discomfort and all right so i hope no problem in answering this question as well this is the image what we saw in the classes for mallory v steer in this particular case what you are seeing this is a endoscopic picture this is the gastroesophageal junction and there is a longitudinal mucosal tear what you can notice right so this is what you see in mallory v steer and this bleeds commonly seen in alcoholics vomiting fine a patient underwent surgery for which she was immobilized for a prolonged duration the doctor examined and found homen sign to be positive homen sign positive homen and moses we have been talking about again this is a repeat question very recently asked question so homen and moses sign they are clearly seen in deep vein thrombosis and here the examiner has given you a history that there is a female who has underwent some surgery and she was immobilized for a prolonged duration doctor examined homen sign positive this is deep vein thrombosis single liner question right a lady presented with sudden arterial occlusive disease that means he is talking about some embolism poorest prognosis factor he is asking you know the different p's of embolism for example if we talk about five p's of embolism then they are pain pallor pulselessness paresthesias paralysis and if you add sixth p then it is poikilothermia okay now out of these different signs which is having the poorest prognosis obviously if paralysis has occurred then the chances of limb loss are very high if we go into details of this we can categorize this acute arterial occlusion or embolic phenomena in the peripheral vessels into three categories 1 2 and 3 2 can be further subdivided into 2a and 2b right till 2a we feel that it is nicely salvageable we go ahead with the medical treatment we do th give thrombolytic therapy and all why 2b the chances become dicey and there the paralysis story starts so that is an indication of poor prognosis now this is a ent question killian's dehiscence is found in between between which muscles i hope we have learned this so many times and again this question has been repeated like anything in 2019 also they asked the same question they asked through which muscle it was inferior constrictor muscle this time they asked between which two muscles that is the thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus we have got this killian's dehiscence it is not the thyro and the stylopharyngeus it is not the crico and the stylopharyngeus it is not the inferior and the middle constrictor the best answer would be thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus for killian's dehiscence so i hope my dear doctors you would have marked this answer also correct okay a patient presented to the emergency after blunt abdominal trauma with very low blood pressure that means the patient is hemodynamically unstable what should be the initial step you have written it nicely you have understood the concept nicely 
that the first thing what we are doing in hemodynamically unstable patient is we are starting the resuscitation with intravenous normal saline. If normal saline is not there, then we are using ringolactate. These are crystalloids. So the first step to be done is resuscitation with intravenous crystalloids. Once we have started the resuscitation, then we take the patient to the operation theater for laparotomy. CECT would be a wastage of time. The patient can die if you take this hemodynamically unstable patient in the CT scan room and start resuscitation with blood products. Yes, if the patient has lost a significant amount of uh, blood, more than 30% of blood loss, which might be the case in this, then definitely we will have to resuscitate with blood blood products. But what he's asking is the initial step. So initially, we start pumping in crystalloids immediately and then we call the blood products, right? And then we take this patient for laparotomy, right? So my dear doctors, I hope uh, that uh, you would have gone through uh, these questions and I hope uh, on the basis of students recall, these were the questions which have been asked in the exam. This is all about the part one surgery FMG recall. Wish you all the very best and would be coming up soon with the next part, part two, to complete the different surgery questions. We have got 51 questions here written. Thank you very much. God bless you all.